Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to part two of our 2020 year in review. I'm so pleased to be joined again by a wonderful panel that includes Stephen Bain, a social and political analyst, essayist, and lecturer in the Jewish community who served for four decades as the American Jewish Committee's Director of Contemporary Jewish Life and its Koppelman Institute on American Jewish Israel Relations. Eric Yaffe is one of the Jewish community's foremost liberal columnists and lecturers whose op-ed pieces can be found at ericyaffe.com. Eric is also President Emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism, American Jewry's largest congregational organization, which he led from 1996 to 2012. Betty Ehrenberg is a veteran in Jewish organizational life, having served as executive director for the Institute for Public Affairs, the political action arm of the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations of America. Betty currently serves as the North American Executive Director of the World Jewish Congress. And Jonathan Tobin is one of American Jewry's leading conservative journalists and columnists, formerly the executive editor of Commentary Magazine. Jonathan now is editor-in-chief of the online news service, JNS.org, the Jewish News Syndicate. Thank you all once again for joining me to review this year in Review 2020. Thank you so much. Great to be with you, Mark. Good to be with you. Thank you. Be here. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thank you. Always a pleasure for me too, Steve, all of you. All right, so in part one, most of you seem to say that the single most important event in terms of impact for the Jewish world is the COVID-19 pandemic. And you were eloquent in explaining why and in what ways it would have impact on the Jewish community going forward. We also spoke quite a bit about the Abraham Accords, the initiative in the Trump administration that, will, that brought peace between the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel, and has created other Muslim countries to begin to normalize relationships with the state of Israel. But there are a lot of other issues that were very important in 2020, and I want to see what the next issues for you would be, as well as hearing whom you think is the Jewish person of the year. And I want to begin by asking you simply to comment on Israeli politics. So we had the third Israeli election in 12 months in March. It was not until May that a unity government between Likud and Blue and White was formed. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu pledged he would serve for 18 months and then actually leave public life and Benny Gantz would take over. Since then, it seems as if that has fallen apart. I would like any of you to comment for me. What do you think the Israeli political scene is now and how will it impact American Jewish Israeli relations? Steve Bain. Well, the most important uh, um, evolution in Israeli politics, um, really it's been going on for many years. The prime minister certainly added to it, but uh, it pre-existed him is that Israeli politics has been moving steadily rightward. Um, the, uh, the balance of, uh, pow of authority, if you will, is that Israel right now is a center-right country and not a center-left country. Um, again, that goes back to 67, but it's especially enhanced since the collapse of Oslo in 2000. Uh, the prime minister has been around now for, uh, I guess, 11, uh, 11 years come, come this February. He has enhanced that, uh, that process, that direction. The price of that is quite considerable. Um, number one is the means the demise of Israel's Labor Party. Once the dominant party, perhaps for too long, three decades, 29 years. Um, but essentially, there is no left-wing alternative uh, within the Israeli political scene right now. Uh, the differences between blue and white 
and, and Likud are real, but their difference is again really on the right side of the spectrum. Number two, and this is probably the biggest challenge for American Jewry, is that outside of the Orthodox world, the natural leanings of American Jews towards Israeli politics is precisely with that Labor Party. Um, Shimon Peres was the most popular uh, Israeli uh, in, in, the, in the American Jewish scene. Will American Jews continue to identify with an Israel that is moving gradually but clearly on a more right-wing direction? Um, I think the answer to that in, in some respects will, um, will also depend upon uh, the, uh, the internal Jewish commitments of American Jews to leading a Jewish life, so to speak, meaning that the more American Jews are intensifying their Jewish core, which has been mentioned before, um, the more they will say Israel is at the very center of, of Jewish life. It's the greatest success story of modern Jewish history. The less they are doing so, meaning the more they're assimilating more outside the core, the less the, attempt, the, the, uh, the identification or the attachment to Israel. I'll put it in simple words, the more you distance yourself from matters Jewish, the more you're going to distance yourself from Israel. Perhaps the key expression of this, which um, continues to bother me, uh, is the evolution of really in the last 12 months of, uh, of Peter Beinart. Uh, Peter Beinart was a, a well-known Zionist. I invited him twice to address American Jewish audiences, which, which he did. We disagree with him on, on many aspects, but there was no disagreement about Israel as a Jewish state. Um, his op-ed piece in the New York Times in that respect was disturbing. Even more disturbing is that I do, I do think it speaks to a large percentage of younger American Jews who see Israel as occupiers, as a, as a state that is too oppressive, and certainly a state that is too conservative for them. So those, I think, are some of the uh, dynamics between American Jewry and Israeli politics right now. Okay. By the way, because you brought up Beinert, and I definitely wanted to discuss him in part two today, I would love now to hear people, we'll digress for a moment, and I would love to hear what you feel about Beinart saying he no longer supports a Jewish state anywhere in, in the Middle East and that he believes it should be a binational state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Eric, what's your sense of Beinart's position? And do you agree with Steve that it represents something of significance inside the younger section of the Jewish community? I'm not sure that it represents uh, a broad trend uh, uh, among young Jews. Exactly where young Jews are or not is, is difficult to know. Generally speaking, American Jews, uh, I believe uh, I uh, you know, identify with Israel's destiny, care about Israel's welfare. I think that remains uh, the case, even though there are real concerns about the fate of the Palestinians that we've we've uh, already uh, expressed. As to Peter Beinert, it was, a, 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 I thought, a, a, a terrible article, a deeply distressing development. Uh, he was a, a person that I agreed with on, on, on many issues, uh, disagreed with him on some, felt him to be too extreme in a few areas, but fundamentally he was a two-state person, as am I. Fundamentally, he was somebody who agreed in a, uh, that we had to have a Jewish and democratic Israel and wanted you know, to get us there. And um, it, you know, he made that really the heart of his, his plea and his message to American Jews. He said, I have this criticism and this criticism and this criticism, but you need to know, uh, I believe in a Jewish and democratic state. And then all of a sudden he didn't believe in a Jewish democratic state. Right. And what he had sworn uh, you know, was, was a central belief just dissipated uh, uh, overnight for reasons that I thought, uh, in, in, uh, without going into them, were basically absurd and, and showed for a very sophisticated guy uh, uh, a fundamental lack of understanding of, of Jewish history and world history. So it was a distressing uh, development. I think he's now taken himself out, out of the, the Jewish mainstream. I think he'll be a, a, a marginal, a fringe figure for most of the Jewish community. And I hope and pray that what he's, uh, what he's expressing you know, will not be taken up by, uh, by others in the Jewish community, young or old. Eric, in any way does Beinert now articulate the J Street position? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. J Street remains 
uh, a, a two-state organization. They speak the language of two states in a Jewish and democratic Israel. And again, look, I'm, I, I have disagreed with them in, in public and in private on a number of occasions uh, over the years. It's not exactly a secret. But in terms of fundamental outlook, they're two states, they're for two states, and as, as am I. That is not where Beinert is. Beinert took himself out of that camp. So it, it's not fair, it's not right to identify J Street with Beinert. Very well said. Betty, your response to the Beinert piece. It's appalling. Uh, I hope he doesn't have the influence that uh, we here seem to think that he does. Um, I would like to go back to something that Steve said, which I think is extremely important, which is uh, about the alienation of young Jews or Jews who don't want to or do not or, or, or were not given enough Jewish education, Jewish background, not, not enough uh, awareness of uh, the importance of Israel in Jewish tradition and Jewish life and Jewish history. Uh, not identifying with Israel uh, and uh, somehow getting caught into what we talked about, what we discussed as the um, political divide. Uh, uh, to say Israel is too conservative, too oppressive, too, these are, uh, I mean, these are slogans that you hear very often from <coughs> politicians, often politicians on the left in Israel. This is how, this is their political discourse. And this is too bad because I think it really gives uh, the wrong impression. To me, Israel is uh, politically and religiously a very intense democracy. Uh, that's how Jews are. Uh, and uh, to uh, decide that uh, if you're a young American Jew that you're not going to identify with Israel or support Israel uh, or feel uh, Israel in your bones the way I guess I wish most American Jews would uh, is usually as a result of not what Israel does or doesn't do or is or isn't not, but it's about what we have neglected to do, which is to educate our children uh, uh, sufficiently, uh, especially uh, teenagers. It is tragic that very often young Jews don't know anything about Israel until uh, hopefully, luckily, they get uh, onto a birthright trip, which is late. It's very late. And it's uh, sort of unreal. And as wonderful as it is, and thank God for it, uh, it's too much to expect uh, from a 10-day trip or a three-week trip to make up for uh, all the knowledge and background that you really should have. Whatever stripe of... of uh, uh, whatever kind of Hebrew school, Jewish school, a uh, day school, whatever of whatever stream there is, um, and we all have them. There are so many ways to be educated Jewishly today, um, digitally, virtually, in person, through synagogues, JCCs, that if you don't, there is something really hurtful to the Jewish people who would not take the opportunity to really do that. And uh, I think that that is what is our problem uh, about uh, non-identification with Israel or non-support for Israel in the American Jewish community. Okay, thank you. Jonathan, first your comment about Beinert. Well, I think this is, this is part of a, an entire subject. Steve was right is when he said that Israel has become uh, center right, I, I've referred to it as a, a, a broad consensus on war and peace and security issues in Israel that is not shared by most American Jews who are, they are center left or left liberal. And um, they find it hard to, um, they find it hard to support Israel or, you know, they, they find it, that kind of Israel alienating. But I think most of the problem is, I think Betty touched on it very ably. It's not so much about Netanyahu or settlements, however controversial they may be. It's about demography. It's about what is happening to American Jewry, specifically non-Orthodox American Jewry, and the rise of what the Pew Research Institute called in its 2013 survey, Jews of no religion. And Jews of no religion do not have a, on the whole, a strong sense of Jewish peoplehood. And if you don't have a sense of Jewish peoplehood, all of the stuff about Israel is essentially meaningless to you, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what it's doing. 
no matter what its policies are, no matter what its leaders are doing. Yes. And that, that, that's, a, that's a key point to understand here. And where Beinart plays into it is the question we have to ask is what are these Jews of no religion or these Jews on the left? Where are their opinions evolving to or devolving to when it comes to Israel? Um, one of the most distressing, you know, distressing things to me about the Jewish community in recent years is, uh, you know, I, I disagree with uh, my friends over at J Street. We disagree about a lot of things, and I think their views are really, I think Mark, you know, they, they, you know, they are, um, their views are almost irrelevant to the politics of Israel, or of what's going to be said in the next election campaign. However, they are, or at least avowedly Zionist, as Eric said, they're pro-Israel. They say they're pro-Israel, pro-peace, and if so, that's good enough for me, we can disagree. However, we have groups like If Not Now, groups like Jewish Voice for Peace that are avowedly anti-Zionist, that are guilty in some instances of not merely demonizing and delegitimizing Israel, but as with Jewish Voice for Peace with its deadly exchange program where they're really almost engaging in, in blood libels about American Jewish supporters of Israel. To what extent are we not merely losing support because of Jews not caring about Israel, because they don't really care about Jewish peoplehood, to what extent are these anti-Zionist, you know, really uh, profoundly negative groups, groups that are not merely dissenting about the policies of, uh, of any uh, Israeli government of the day, but about the existence of Israel? And that's where Beinart comes in. Now, you know, his, his previous iteration as a liberal Zionist, as a avowed liberal Zionist, as he called himself, and his book, which, you know, avowed liberal Zionism, and you know, whose purpose, whose advocacy for two states was certainly legitimate, I might disagree with a lot. That book itself was filled with ignorance and basically intellectual tourism. And that came to its logical conclusion when you know, the Israelis didn't listen to his pleas, so he says to hell with Israel, to hell with the Jewish state, and now finds himself on panels on anti-Semitism with anti-Semites, uh, like, like Rashida Tlaib and uh, <laughs> so it, it's, you know, that, that to me is where, you know, you know, can J Street hold the line against Jewish Voice for Peace? And if not now, um, it's odd for me to say it, but I hope so. Of course, I hope so. I hope we have a vigorous Jewish debate between, you know, Zionists of different stripes, between Zionists of different stripes, you know, we can agree to disagree, we can argue, but in the end, we're all for Israel. Absolutely. But if if a significant number of Jews are basically leaving the reservation, along with uh, Peter Beinart, with his bizarre and I think you know profoundly ignorant and foolish and you know um, uh, just really a matter of self-regard and, and ego um, in what he's gone through, um, and to support groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now, or Students for Justice in Palestine, which engages in open anti-Semitism, then then we're talking about a, a problem. Uh, that goes beyond uh, mere assimilation. And that's one that we, as a Jewish community, we have to address. And we have to address it in the context of what do we mean by a big tent when a portion of the Jewish community is basically at war with the idea of the Jewish state. And that's, that's not a big tent that um, I think is viable. Oh, that's a very frightening thing to contemplate. If there ever becomes a significant percentage of the Jewish community that would agree with Peter Beinart that there shouldn't be a Jewish state because a lot of secular Jews who have nothing to do with the synagogue life, but they self-identify as Jews and they are proud of the state of Israel, even if they disagree with policies. But if they begin to say there shouldn't be a Jewish state, then it seems to me, and I'm now addressing this to the panel as a whole, that's a different dynamic of problem which i do not believe exists now and i don't i don't want to believe that it is in the any, anywhere in our immediate future steve what do you say well, mark I, I distinguish here between those who say there should not be a jewish state and those who are indifferent to it the number of people that would say there should not be a jewish state is really very very limited i agree um the number of people who don't care one way or another uh, who probably couldn't identify Israel on a map if they saw it. That is a real and present danger. I agree that, again. <laughs> that relates to the point about assimilation, uh, is that the toll of assimilation is very real and serious. 
frankly, uh, politics can never be a substitute for serious Jewish identity. And in that respect, um, while the, uh, we talk about the events of 2020, uh, so much of it is revolved around political threats to Jews. Uh, you can't build identity on the fact that the Jews have too many enemies. That's a terrible reason to be Jewish. And in that sense, um, my point really is that our concern should be less with those who say should not be a state of Israel because there simply aren't too many of them at this point. Um, our concern really should be focused upon those who say, Israel doesn't mean anything to me. And that to me is a much clearer and present danger at present. Well said. Uh, I'm gonna come back to you, Jonathan. Speak now about the impact of Israeli elections on the dynamic between American Jewry and Israel. What's your sense of what it, the political scene has done to fray relationships between American Jews and the state of Israel? I think I'd like to introduce into this discussion, um, you know, something that relates to what we've been talking about, about assimilation, what I refer to as the rise of Jews of no religion, Jews without a sense of Jewish peoplehood, is that for the Jews who are really into Israel, um, that's you know, heavily Orthodox, but it's not only Orthodox. There are large numbers of Reform and conservative Jews who are very pro-Israel, who um, and even you know non-affiliated Jews who are still maybe that's a absolutely, um, no, absolutely. who still care about Israel. Absolutely. But among those who are really passionately involved in Israel, the problem isn't as great as sometimes we represent it. Um, for those who follow Israel closely, who care about it, who are on the inside of the Jewish community, whether. Orthodox, conservative, reform, right, left. I think they, you know, they understand what's going on. I think they will accept the outcome uh, of Israeli democracy as they've accepted it all along, even if they don't personally agree with Netanyahu or whatever comes out there. I think, uh, the, you know, for those who don't follow Israel closely, who, you know, it, it's all very alien to them. Um, Netanyahu seems, you know, very strange. Um, uh, the truth is. Israeli politics the last two years has not been about what do we do about the Palestinians? It's been, what do we do about Netanyahu? And do, do, you, know, do you want him to continue in office? And we have the creation of this center right parties. Um, the last three elections, it was blue and white, um, which basically attempted to run to the right of Netanyahu on security issues, whether all the people involved with it really believe that or not. Um, so there was no argument about those issues that American Jews purport to care about. Um, in this upcoming election, we'll have a new non-Netanyahu party, uh, apparently led by Gideon Sa'ar and with another cast of characters, um, you know, um, and uh, they might succeed. I would never underestimate Netanyahu's uh, political skills and survival skills. Um, you know, I'll believe he's, he's, I'll believe he's lost when he's lost. Um, but either way, it's going to be a center-right religious government. Um, that's something that many American Jews certainly, you know, the whole dynamic with the, with the ultra-Orthodox and their ability to, because they have the votes. Um, and I say this as a conservative Jew, large, you know, capital C conservative Jew, not a conservative small C Jew. Um, that's troubling to the vast majority of American Jews who are non-Orthodox, but that's just not an issue for most Israelis. Mm. And so, um, however that sorts itself out, um, I don't think the next election is going to have a major impact on American Jewish opinion of Israel. People who care about Israel will deal with it um, and understand it. People who don't care about Israel will find it as alien as the governments that went before. They would find, you know, even if somehow the uh, sort of a moderate uh, center left Zionist government, you know, Israeli government could somehow be formed, which is, you know, a fantasy right now. I don't think, you know, I don't think a Shimon Peres led government, if Shimon Peres came back from, from the world to come and led some sort of, you know, version of Kadima or, or labor, he, he would have just as many problems with um, the, the Jews who have so many problems with Israel as Netanyahu does, um, as charming and as uh, user-friendly for American Jews as he tried to be. Uh, the divide is not about policy. The divide is about demography, as I said before. Fascinating. Betty, what do you think about this? 
Well, uh, I think Israeli politics will continue to be messy. It, they've always, it's always been messy. Uh, the um, the bottom line for American Jews, I think is, again, I, I agree with what Jonathan said. I think it's uh, the people who care about Israel or who know about Israel enough to care about Israel will continue to do so. We have had all kinds of governments in Israel. We've had labor governments. We've had Menachem Begin. We've had Yitzhak Shamir. We had Yitzhak Rabin. There have been many kinds of Israeli governments. Uh, the right one for Israel at the right time each time, I, I like to believe. And uh, we have found ways in the American Jewish community to support Israel and to uh, make sure that our government supports Israel and that uh, uh, she has uh, foreign aid and her qualitative military edge and all of that. Uh, is it harder to do uh, in these times? We've talked about this before many times, I think, on this program where we've discussed um, uh, why young people don't seem to have the fervor for Israel that we did when we were younger because we experienced the Six Day War or the 73 War or because our parents were Holocaust survivors. That it's, it's a different time now. And because it is a different time now and, and young people uh, and many Jews don't see uh, the survival of Israel as, as, as critical, as, as something of an emergency for the Jewish people uh, as, uh, as a whole, I go back, I, again, I, I attribute to what I said before. It's a lack of uh, learning Jewish history. It's a lack of learning Zionist history. And it's a lack of uh, not uh, having been educated in uh, uh, why in our traditions and what Israel and the place that Israel holds in it. So I think it, it, it's never about, um, the, the, a lot of the details of Israeli politics. Israel will always be something else. She will evolve with, with her times. She, she will evolve with, with the, the circumstances that, that she's presented with in each, in each generation, in each, whether it's a political situation, whether it's a security situation, whether it's the shifting sands of the Arab neighborhood around her. Uh, and it, it's, um, she, she will adapt, I believe it. I think that she will adapt, she's adapting now. And if uh, American Jews decide they don't wanna be, they don't wanna come to the party, they don't wanna be part of this, ex of this exciting endeavor that is the Jewish people in the third commonwealth uh, in, in her, uh, in, in our Shivatz period of Shivat Zion of, of our, of our miracle of the state of Israel in our lifetime, what our parents and grandparents would have given anything to see, then uh, that's really a tragedy. Okay, as beautifully said also. Eric, uh, I'm coming back to you and I'm trying to think of how I want to pose this. Uh, I've, I've kid you often that you sort of represent a position all by yourself when I have you on these panels. Um, and it's not so much today as other times, but one of the, I'm gonna tell you what many people say when it comes to criticism of the liberal community inside the Jewish world, and more specifically, the reform movement. And you've heard Steve reference the fact that for many Jews, politics has become the real religion that drives them. And that there are those who have argued that within the reform movement, the Democratic Party has replaced the Jewish tradition. That because the a reform movement has this laudable and noble commitment to social justice, and again, when I was growing up, there was the, there was no such thing as tikkun olam, and I go out of my way not to use that phrase since it's not a rabbinic phrase, and it really is a a distortion of what Judaism teaches. But I understand that in terms of an idiom, tikkun olam now stands for social justice and enhancing the world, and there are those who see the reform movement as caring only about the general overall 
social needs of America as a whole, and that the reform movement as a movement is not replete with Jews on the congregational level who are passionately committed to the state of Israel, regardless of the politics of Israel and Eric, more to the point, regardless of whether the Israeli people care enough about Jewish pluralism that they're fighting for reform, conservative, reconstructionist Judaism in the state of Israel and what happens at the Western Wall and things of that nature. I'm asking you, as you, we look at 2020, how do you personally assess? You're a deeply committed Zionist. How do you, what is your both, your, the best feelings you have about the reform movement and liberal Judaism, which includes conservative Jews and reconstructionist Jews? And are you at all critical of any aspect of that, that in terms of social trends that you see part of the Jewish world in 2020? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try and, and give a, a movement response, but obviously I'm, I'm answering as a, as a committed reform Jew, so you Absolutely. take that into account. Fine. There, there are two, two aspects here. A number of people have said, and I, I strongly agree, the more Jewish you are, the more committed you are to Israel. That's the fundamental point. And uh, look, we're Jews not because uh, the Gentiles hate us, but because God has chosen us. And uh, we need a tradition-based Torah embracing Judaism. And it's our responsibility in uh, our movement as it is in every movement to promote that. We have a progressive take on the tradition, uh, uh, rightly so in our, in our view. To the extent that we are successful, our people are gonna care about Israel. And to the extent that we are not successful, they will not care about Israel. And so our movement needs to do more than it's done. This is always the case, and it's the case now more than ever, because given the particular nature of American society and the high rates of, of, of uh, uh, assimilation and, and uh, the enticing nature of what our uh, modern world offers us, we need a, uh, uh, a more Jewish movement and a more Jewish community, and that will turn the eyes of our members towards Israel. Have we done enough of that? No. Do we have to do more of it? Absolutely. Do we have a committed core um, who both embrace Judaism and, and look towards uh, Israel and are concerned about Israel's destiny? We absolutely do. We have to expand that core and begin to move towards the edges of what is a very large movement. And we have too many people on the margins who are drifting away. So let's, let's uh, uh, state that acknowledge the, the challenge and at the same time recognize uh, uh, the achievements. And by the way, the issues of, the, of uh, assimilation and drifting away both from tradition and Israel exist in all movements, including the Orthodox movement. Yes. Uh, and uh, we recognize that as well. Yeah. What I don't accept and what makes me somewhat uncomfortable about this conversation is the notion that what Israel does makes no difference. Um, I mean, it, of course it makes a difference. Look, if, if you're committed to Israel, you're gonna get in and you're gonna carry on the good fight. And that's always my message. We don't have to agree with everything the Israelis do. We don't have to endorse any particular government. And to the extent that we're unhappy, um, we understand that family is family. The Jewish state is the Jewish state. And uh, we fight for our principles and our values. And, and we understand uh, you know, the essence of Jewish peoplehood. Having said that, the state of Israel uh, uh, reasonably, you know, we can have, we can reasonably have expectations of the state of Israel. A, they should make it easier for us. B, uh, they should be true to what I believe are, are the central tenets of Zionism. Now, that does not mean, in my view, when I talk to Reform Jews, that we have to be involved in the nitty gritty of drawing boundaries and this line and that line, it's, that just is not our job. Just is not our job, leave it alone. Uh, but there, there are two overriding principles, it seems to me, that we endorse, that Zionism endorse, and that we look to the state of Israel to endorse. First of all, and I've mentioned both of them before and I've mentioned them a hundred times, we want the state of Israel to be a democratic state in the commonly accepted sense of that term. 
and uh, the, the leaders of Israel should be able to articulate their democratic values and how they're going to move towards a democratic reality, even if Palestinian issues don't make it possible right now and today. And second of all, we're committed to a, a, a state of Israel that embraces all Jews, that says all Jews stood at Sinai. That says uh, the, the, the state of Israel does not belong to the, the Orthodox establishment. And I appreciate what Jonathan said, it's not on the agenda, so on and so forth. The Haredim, there are a million Haredim. Well, there are 9 million Israelis and there are 8 million who are not Haredim. And if the state of Israel wants to be the state of the Jewish people, which it affirms again and again and again, it can't then say, you should excuse me that, well, for this particular group, your synagogues are whorehouses. You can't say that. You can't say that the, the most sacred places of, of, of the Jewish people, whether it's the wall or somewhere else, uh, you're not really welcome there. Or you're not welcome there on the same basis as everybody else. You cannot say that. That's not what Zionism was about. That's not what Herzl said. And um, democracy, religious freedom, those two principles need to be central. Uh, I'm gonna push Israel in that direction if they're not willing to go. And I'm gonna hope that they, out of, out of their own sense of Zionist commitment and Jewish peoplehood, uh, will move towards those principles on their own. Eric, do you have any doubt that Israel is a democratic state? Israel is a democratic state. It could be moving in a non-democratic direction if it doesn't uh, think through how it's going to deal with issues of the occupation and the ultimate fate of the Palestinians. Okay, I've heard that. I've heard that. Well, the Six Day War was in 67. So that's th it's for 50 years I've heard this. And somebody mentioned in part one, John Kerry, when he was Secretary of State, warning us this was the last chance. I've heard that it's the last chance forever. Uh, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on this. To me, there is no, I don't understand why anybody even questions whether Israel is or is not a democracy. Of course, it's a democracy. It also has treated the Palestinian Israeli and even the Palestinian who lives on the West Bank or in Gaza better than any other society has ever handled the non in the, it, it, its other population when it's been basically at war with them from, well, certainly for the last 50 years, and some would say for the last 70 plus years. So I, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on this or what I'm let me... alone, but for me, that it's not a question of, I want Israel to be democratic. Of, of course, Israel is democratic. And of course, Israel has had a problem since, since it was established. What would ever happen if there was a larger non-Jewish population inside the state of Israel, which by the way, is theoretically possible, no matter what it does with the West Bank. But I don't want you to give people the idea, and maybe, and I'm really asking you if that was your intent, to suggest to people that Eric Yaffe questions in any way whether Israel is at the moment a vibrant, honest, democracy, which you can be proud of. Israel is a democratic state. There are politicians in Israel, including those uh, who are reasonable candidates for prime minister, who advocate a vision, which is not a democratic vision. Explain to me what that means. In what way? What, what, are they, in other words, are they, are they going to strip non-Jews in Israel of the vote? No, what, what they're saying is we will have some kind of political arrangement whereby uh, we will control the West Bank, but West Bank uh, Palestinian residents will not have full equal rights in the way uh, that Israelis will. There will be two sets of laws, one which will apply to, uh, to West Bank residents and one which will apply to uh, Israelis. And usually the term that's used is autonomy or something of that sort. 
But again, uh, democracy in, in the, the generally accepted sense of that term, which is uh, uh, a single set of laws applicable to all residents um, is not part of their vision. And uh, Naftali Bennett definitely falls into, into, that, into that category. So um, he wants uh, eternal control of the territories and he doesn't want to extend full rights to all of the Palestinian residents. He's prepared to extend rights to a, a small percentage. Okay, that's his position. Uh, you can read it on his website. Uh, it is not a, a democratic resolution of the current political conflict. Even as I say right now, this minute, there is no resolution I acknowledge uh, and that's why I affirm that Israel is today a democracy. I want to fight against those politicians who have a non-democratic vision. I don't okay. think it's consistent with Zionism. Okay. Does do any of the three of you disagree with Eric's analysis? You know, well, I I'm, think. I'm, go ahead, Jonathan. Go ahead. Go um, ahead, John. Of course, Israel is a democracy, and yes, if Israel were to apply its law extends sovereignty as the annexation camp wanted to do earlier this year throughout the entire West Bank, uh, as opposed to just the area C, the places which are already under Jewish, uh, under Israeli law in the settlements, that would create, an, would create more than the current anomalous situation in which Israel proper is, is a functioning democracy and the, the territories are in this sort of anomalous situation where they're internally governed for the most part by the Palestinian Authority, but they don't have security control. And there's no resolution to this, to this conflict and no, no one in sight. Um, I believe, you know, you ask yourself, what do you believe with, true, with, with uh, you know, uh, what do you believe truly? Um, I don't think that Israel will ever annex all of the West Bank. I don't believe any peace would involve that. Um, I don't think the majority of the Israeli people want that, but neither do they wish to abandon security control of the West Bank under for the foreseeable future. So Israel will remain a democracy. But the problem is, is that it's, it's not a clean, we haven't gotten to a resolution of the problem and the resolution to the problem isn't in sight. So it allows some on the far left, some among the anti-Zionist camp, to pretend that Israel is not a democracy, that Israel is an apartheid state, and that is a big lie. Um, and, and that's, you know, it, this is, it's complicated, but it's also simple. Well, I, I very much agree with what Jonathan said. I think the, uh, I think Israel is a democracy, and I think um, she struggles with the um, uh, situation in the West Bank or in the in Judea and Samaria because of, uh, not because of what Israel ever did, although Israel did accept, uh, accept the international request to administer the territories until the solution would be found. Let's not forget Israel sued for peace right after the Six Day War. Um, but it's because of what, uh, in my opinion, what the Arab world failed to do, and that's which was to uh, uh, help absorb uh, their brethren or to um, uh, keep the uh, situation of the Palestinians in, in permanent refugee status, which is uh, first of all unfair to them, second of all an artificial uh, creation, and third of all meant to be a thorn in the side of Israel for so long. So you have what you have. I, I do think also there is no end in sight right now. Uh, there will be one in the future, what, however that will be determined, because uh, Israel wants peace and uh, nobody wants to continue this way forever and ever. I don't think that because, and I think this causes uh, the formation of politicians' uh, opinions, uh, the very left, the very right. Don't forget there are many Arab members of Knesset who have said uh, uh, things that sound like Peter Beinart. Uh, we have to figure out here um, uh, in, in this messy soup, uh, you have, uh, I still think, uh, a democracy and uh, one that really struggles to stay a democracy and be a democracy in a very admirable way, in my opinion. And uh, let's not forget there are all kinds of democracies. 
Uh, we talk about democracy as Americans and we have a very specific vision of exactly what that is. That's not the same kind of democracy in Great Britain. It's not the same kind of democracy in France, all Western democracies. Uh, not, and uh, are, are, in, are nor, nor the same as many other countries that are democratic countries. It varies. So to, and Americans have a tendency to uh, want to uh, put their way of doing things, think, seeing things and solving problems uh, on others very, very often. And we as American Jews tend to do that a lot regarding Israelis, let's not forget. So, um, Let's keep in mind, I think we need to keep in mind as Americans and going back to the other topic we were discussing, if we want our children, our young people to uh, identify with Israel, even though it is not the exact same democracy as exactly ours, um, we need to, to be cognizant of that and to, and to make it and to um, educate people to that. Okay. So Eric, I want to then speak to the second thing that you said and you talked about how Israel should be a state of all the Jews. And you said it so eloquently, and you're 100% right in my position, in my opinion. And then you said that that means that the reform, the conservative, the reconstructionist, the non Orthodox Jew. His synagogue should be treated the same way as Orthodox synagogues are treated. That's one of the examples that's given. In essence, Orthodox synagogues receive funding from the government, non-Orthodox synagogues do not. And that to me, and I'm now, I'm describing myself and I wanna know whether as I describe myself, Eric, it's a description that would apply to you as well. I've been to Israel many, 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 times. I get off the plane. I feel I've come home. I'm with Israelis all the time. Never once, not once, has an Israeli made me feel like because I'm not an Orthodox Jew, somehow I don't belong, or that I'm not an equal Jew, or that Israel, they're not thrilled to have me. I have been at home in Israel, wherever I go, not because of some kind of establishment, but the Israeli people embrace me as a Jew, just as Jew. And you know, I had, I had a run in with an Orthodox rabbi at the Western Wall, when I brought my chavurah there and we were singing prayers and it was, a, the menorah had already been lit and some big, huge Orthodox guy um, in black came and was about to hit me. And some small, some small French Jew came up to this rabbi and told him, what are you doing? Here you have people who came from America and they're, they're singing whatever they're singing. Uh, on the, on the, you know, sort of like the esplanade behind the Western Wall area or in front of it. And my point is that there are institutional issues, but those institutional issues should be seen as institutional issues, not as Israeli-American conflict issues. The Israeli doesn't look at me as a second-class Jew. He doesn't look at you she doesn't look at you as a second class Jew. There are structural things that are uncomfortable for you. And would I like to be able to be able to be a Messiah Kedushin at a wedding in Israel and have it count to be the rabbi at a wedding? Sure. At the moment, that's not the rules. But it doesn't affect my affection for Israel, my commitment to Israel, my love of Israel. And then I come back to what you said that I thought again was so eloquently said, we are a family. The Jewish people are family and we don't always agree. So what? My commitment is to my family and I respect the fact that Eric Yaffe will do everything he can for as long as he can to move the institutions of Israel to be more inclusive of the non-Orthodox Jew. That in some way at one point, 
Israel will be more embracing of what Americans mean, mean by Jewish pluralism. But in the meantime, I don't want any non-Orthodox Jew, I don't want any American Jew to believe that that gives him license to feel something negative about Israel, to withhold money from Israel, to withhold political support from Israel. And I don't believe you would ever want that. But for me, the issue is not about American Jew in Israel. It's about the institutional issues, which will be worked out over time and will only be worked out. And now we're going to something Jonathan said, when Israelis care enough and your lobbying Israelis is the right thing for you to do. But it's wrong to suggest that somehow Israel isn't embracing of world Jewry, of non-Orthodox Jews, because there are institutional issues. Most of Israeli life has nothing to do with the institutional issues that you're talking about. And I'll say it again. I get off the plane. I'm there for a week. I'm there for two weeks. I'm there for a summer, whatever it is. Never once do I feel that I'm a second-class Jew. And at the same time, I recognize there are certain things I can't do with the Western Wall. I can't stand with my wife at the Western Wall if I don't go down to, to Robinson's Arch. But, I, but it doesn't make me feel alienated from Israel. And I right. want somebody with your influence to say the same thing, unless you disagree with me. <laughs> Look, of, of course I agree. For someone like me, I'm a, you know, who's a committed Zionist, he sees the Jewish people as his family and, and the, the, the nation of Israel as his family. I am never going to say, walk away, stop being committed, stop donating, stop supporting. And I'm always going to say, get in there and fight to make change because we believe in change. Having said that, I mean, your analysis that it's simply an institutional issue, I want to suggest is, is too simple and to some extent a misreading. It's not just an institutional issue and whether or not reform synagogues get allocations, I care about that. That's not the heart of the matter. You have a religious monopoly in the Jewish state. The state of the Jewish people has a religious monopoly that affects people. You say, I, I, I don't feel anything. There are plenty of people who feel things. There, there are 300,000 uh, um, Jew, uh, there are 300,000 immigrants from Russia, uh, most of whom would have converted to Judaism if there was a path for them to do so. And because there's a religious monopoly, and guess what? Religious monopolies don't work anywhere in the world. There's not a single country in the world where religious monopolies end up working to the benefit either of that religion or to the citizens in general. I don't, I don't disagree with you. You have 300, but, it's not, but it's you have, not, excuse me, it's not fair. I wasn't talking about Jews from the former Soviet Union. I was specifically talking about your reference to how American Jews feel about Israel. But what I'm saying is the Jewish state, which is the state of the Jewish people, is saying to a certain segment of its population that wants to convert to Judaism or wants to get married under other auspices, that they can't do that and that their take on Judaism, and these in, uh, include people who are part of my movement, People in some cases have made Aliyah, have gone to Israel and want to give expression to, you know, to their form of Judaism and, and, and to their religious beliefs. They're told they can't do it and it's illegitimate for them. And we're not talking about one or two people or three You're or right. four. You're right. We're and talking it, about right. hundreds and of thousands. So what I'm it's saying, wrong. I'm, it's, it's wrong. But the fact that it's wrong doesn't mean that Israel is somehow anti-reform Jew. Of course it means that. I mean, I, I, Mark, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand this dance. The uh, dance is, the, Eric, the, Eric, when you go to Israel, outside of an institutional issue, you deal, you're in Israel all the time also, and you travel here, and you travel there, and you're socializing here, and you're socializing there. Where, is, where have you ever encountered a somehow, oh, you're a reformed rabbi, you're a reformed Jew? Where did that ever happen to you? I remember getting off the plane and going immediately to the wall with a group of other Jews. We weren't there to demonstrate. We weren't there to do anything. We just walked up to the wall. 
And a group of people said, who are you? And we said, we're reformed Jews from America. And they said to me, this is not your place. Okay, that's wrong. They were wrong. Um, and I was standing with a group of people committed to Israel. We brought them with great enthusiasm and with a, a broad program. It was, it was and they said the to wall. me, what did those people say? It was at the wall. Give me something that is not a, at a religious site. Because most American Jews who visit Israel are at religious sites very infrequently. When you're not at a religious site, give me one example of somehow have you been discriminated against because you're not an Orthodox Jew, because you're a Reformed Jew. Because it never, not once, ever happened to me. And my guess is it has not happened. And this doesn't mean I'm not sympathetic. I'll say it again. I would love to be able to, as a Reformed rabbi, to be able to be a Messiah Kedushin. I think all synagogues of every movement should be funded by the government, if any are funded by the government. I think the system has to change, but it doesn't make me feel that Israel is somehow not mine or doesn't care about me or that it says we are one, but it doesn't mean we are one. Guys, can I jump in and just say one thing? Uh, you know, I, I, th there are points of agreement with both of you that I have. Part of the problem, we talk a lot about American Jewry alienation, American Jewry's alienation from Israel, and there are real issues to deal with there. However, the other part of this is that most Israelis are just not that into American Jews and our concerns. Um, and part of it is about politics, part of it's about culture, um, part of the struggles of the reform and conservative movements which I think both have a lot to offer non-Orthodox Jews. I mean, who mostly identify themselves as Mazorti or traditional, which really blends in with the way a lot of Reform and Conservative Jews live in this country. But, you know, there, there's disconnect on both sides between American Jews and Israeli Jews. Um, Daniel Gordis wrote about this in his, in, in his recent book, and I think it's very true. And so let's, you know, we, we have to look at both ends of the telescope. I agree with you. Israel is, is a wonderful place. It's a welcoming place for Jews. It's, it's a very different culture. You know, you're, 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 you're more likely to be cut off, uh, you know, if you're getting online by somebody, but you're also a lot more likely to be welcome into a complete stranger's home for Shabbat. It, it's a different kind of place and it is wonderful and welcoming and we should all try and, you know, and, and I love it. And um, I think American Jews who go into it with, with open eyes and an open heart will love it too. But let's understand that there are problems on both ends of the spectrum. And if there is, if there is something that worries me is that though to the extent that American Jewry keeps trying to vote, you know, that Israelis are stopping, are stopping. They're not listening as much as they should, just as American Jews don't listen to Israelis as much as they should. I want to put a semicolon there. <laughs> this is worth, you know, a, a, a long discussion just in and of itself but I am very anxious before we close. I need to hear whom you each think is the Jewish person of the year. Okay, Steve Baim, I come to you first. Who is your Jewish person of the year? Um, frankly, Mark, I thought long, long and hard about this and I, uh, I determined there was no um, uh, public personality per se that I could uh, identify as Jewish person of the year. If there were such an award, I would give it to a collective, the collective of Jewish educators, Jewish health workers, health professionals, the people who have been on the front lines of trying to keep up as much normalcy as possible under these extreme conditions of the last year. Those are the people I'd say are the Jewish persons of the year. I love it. Beautiful. Okay. Eric, who is your person of the year? All right, I'm, I'm going to give you two people closely related for reasons that will be clear. I'm going to harken back to what Mark uh, said in his intro. Uh, my uh, men of the year are uh, Jonathan Sachs and Adin Steinsaltz. Um, Sachs uh, was uh, the global Jewish voice for the last quarter century. Orthodox Jews listened to him, Reformed Jews listened to him. He was an ambassador to non-Jews. 
He was a popularizer, but in the best sense, he didn't simplify, he didn't dumb down. He really expressed the, you know, the lofty ideals of Judaism, but with elegance and sophistication, great moral power. He was, was an extraordinary communicator. And then Adin Steinsalt spent 50 years making the Talmud accessible to the Jewish masses. You know, he, he coined the phrase that we all use, let my people know. And uh, 50 years ago, you couldn't open the Talmud and just start reading unless you're a full-time yeshiva student. And he didn't just translate it, he made it user-friendly and he had punctuation and paragraph divisions and background material. And the Hebrew edition, which was completed in 2010 was the, the true masterpiece. The English edition is very good, but the, if, uh, the modern Hebrew edition is absolutely extraordinary. Steinzeltz was our Rashi. He was our Rashi. Uh, Sachs will be remembered for a hundred years. Steinzeltz, I think, will be remembered for a thousand years. Oh, I love it. Just wonderful. Okay, Betty, your pers Jewish person of the year. Well, I had a few. And uh, funnily enough, I picked what Eric picked. <laughs> um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and Rabbi Eiden Steinsaltz. I think their voices will be terribly missed. I mean, talking today about Jewish leadership and uh, who has an influence and who do we listen to and who could have an influence on our young people. And I think they had this, uh, they will be sorely missed because of the way they could be our spokesman. We have so few and, uh, but I have more. So it was complicated. Um, I picked Jared Kushner because of what I said before, the vision and the daring and the willing to go forth. And yes, I do give President Trump credit. Um, and I thought of a woman, I think Barry Wise, whom you mentioned in your introduction as well. I thought that was, uh, that she took a very courageous stance. You should remind our audience if they didn't see part one, what Barry did. Uh, Barry Wise was a, uh, Journalist wrote uh, for the New York Times, uh, her letter of resignation uh, was very powerful uh, and described the um, negative atmosphere that she was experienced there among the, uh, not only the uh, leadership, but also her colleagues and uh, her personal experience of anti-Semitic attitudes and actions. And uh, in her letter of resignation, she came out very directly and spoke about it. And I uh, thought it was very daring. It's not so easy to do that. You think that when you do that, you become radioactive and maybe someone else is not gonna hire you after that. So mm -hmm. I think it was very uh, brave. I really wanted to hear what all of you said about Barry Weiss not Barry Weiss, qua Barry Weiss, but Barry Weiss in terms of the issue that she raised. And what she was saying was that the liberal end of American media is not open to differences across the political or philosophical spectrum. And that they're also very much into cancel culture, where if you don't say what they want you to say, it's, it's, you know, you're just X'd out. And a liberal author, whose name at the moment escapes me, many of you may know, she's a liberal author who wrote a book about the way in which American society right now is being, from her perspective, plagued by a rash of young, very young children and young girls rushing to gender, uh, to change their gender. And she talked about it as a phenomenon and felt that it was not healthy for America and healthy for the girls involved, specifically girls. And she wrote this book, again, a liberal Jewish author. And Amazon refused to sell the book and Target took the book off its shelf. This is as close to what book burning was in prior societies as you can get. 
when you can't, when you're not allowed to publish or sell your book, it's a form of cancel culture equivalent to burning books. And Barry Weiss is speaking out against all of that. And I did want to hear, I, I have such regard for all four of you. I did want to hear what you feel at the moment is going on with, you know, social media deciding what we can and cannot read, what we can and cannot learn, and how that is being has spilled over to giants like Amazon and Target. And Jonathan, you were the editor of Commentary. You're the editor now of JNS, which has a marvelous reputation as being a source, but a conservative source of news and information in the Jewish world. As you look at the Barry Weiss issue, and not Barry Weiss again, qua Barry Weiss, but the issue she raises, how real and important do you think it should be to American Jewry? Well, I think it's very important. I think it's, um, it, in fact, I think issues about um, cancel culture and um, the suppression of views um, and, and indeed um, social media censor censorship, the way the social media oligarchs, these large internet companies and big tech, the way they in, uh, influence um, our politics, the way they influence our culture, I think that's is actually far more important a question than which uh, septuagenarian uh, white guy was gonna be elected president this year. Yes. Um, I think what Barry um, hit on and came up against at the New York Times is you know, a, a change in the culture of journalism specifically um, where um, you know, we have, you know, I, I think you know, I speak as a conservative um, but the point is, in much of the media, um, the, um, the culture of journalism is uniformly liberal. It is aggressively so. It's very difficult for people who are centrist, like Barry, she is not a conservative. Um, you know, um, it's very difficult for them to, to exist in newsrooms like that of the Times because they get run out of there. They are, bull as Barry said, they get bullied. Um, they get censored. Um, more importantly, in a broader sense, um, Americans, um, you know, we're all canceling each other. Let, let's say it's not, um, I have to say, even as a conservative, right-wingers, many right-wingers are very eager to, con to cancel the people that they don't like. Um, this, is, this is something that cuts across political lines. But in terms of the way popular culture works and the way most, most of journalism works, it's uh, liberals who are in charge and it's liberals who are canceling people who dissent. Um, and that is something that is a um, profoundly illiberal trend within our society. Um, it has to do with uh, the way that um, a lot of issues like the Black Lives Matter movement, the way it manifested itself, not the question of, do we believe in racial equality, but how are we willing to discuss it and how are we willing to um, shut down discussion um, when it goes in a direction where the powers that be don't like it? These, these are really existential questions about the future of this republic, um, you know, more than political questions. And I think because they get bound up in a partisan warfare where people pick sides, um, and so they're okay with the, the censorship on, on so, you know, Facebook and Twitter if it favors their side, um, even, you know, no matter which side you're on, I think that's, that's a profoundly dangerous trend in American society. Um, and it's profoundly dangerous to Jews because we, we need democracy. We need to live in a pluralistic society to, 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 Absolutely. to thrive. Absolutely. Thank you. Steve Bain, what's your sense? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's endemic. The cancel culture itself is, is endemic at this, at this point in time. It's not limited to the world of journalism. Uh, the entire debate over uh, historical monuments, um, obviously at the extreme level, they want to cancel Abraham Lincoln. But even take it where their case can be made the, the strongest, namely Confederate monuments. I always thought studying history was a way of engaging movements, people, phenomena, ideas that you may or may not agree with. And the idea of trying to erase history 
You're, you're substituting propaganda really for, uh, for real understanding and knowledge. Does that affect the Jewish community? Again, I think it goes far beyond the issue of, uh, of journalism and social media. Um, uh, if you say things on the, um, uh, on the right that are uh, inimical to the, to the liberal mindset, such as many of the views I've expressed about intermarriage, you get canceled. Uh, if you say things on the, on the left about questions, say, of biblical theology, of biblical criticism, or if you raise, uh, you raise issues about the wisdom of West Bank settlements, very quickly you're going to get canceled in right-wing audiences. So in that respect, I think it's pretty, right now it's, it's very much endemic. What I really blame social media for is something else, namely that um, we've reduced education or public education to a soundbite, you know, to 27 characters or whatever is the, uh, the appropriate language right now. Again, you can't educate people that way. But essentially what I see happening right now is that, um, and here I think Barry Weiss put her, her finger on it, uh, is that forgetting about where you stand on a particular issue, the job of, of public personalities of educating people about that issue, whether it's in the media or whether it's via, via lectures or Zoom meetings like this, you're going to get canceled the more outspoken you are. That's unhealthy in terms of society because it means quashing of freedom of speech. It's unhealthy in terms of, of education that we're no longer grappling with ideas. We're just grappling with, do we have the right slogans? Do we have slogans that will necessarily sell in the constituency we're talking about? Beautifully said. Eric, also your sense of where this culture can't- Well, I'm, I'm pretty much of, a, of an absolutist on, on uh, freedom of speech issues. I mean, it's generally speaking my approach. I acknowledge here that, that uh, social media and technology pose a problem in the sense that I, 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 I'm not sophisticated about it. I don't use it generally much. Uh, very much, and the notion of major monopolies that function there uh, trouble me because it, you know, raises the issue: does that, in some way, distort freedom of uh, expression? Because uh, a very few people have a great deal of power in a way that simply didn't exist before. Um, I'm, I am troubled by the notion uh, that a single individual who uh, you know who owns one of these monopolies should be making significant decisions about what kind of information the American people and people of the world are gonna get. Uh, my own instinct is that, uh, that in those cases, they should be classified, these, these monopolies as public utilities. And to the extent that they should be regulated, they should be regulated by the government and by the people and not by individuals who happen to control them and might misuse that power. Right now, those people may be on the left, in the future, they will be on the right. And in both cases, I think we're we're potentially threatened by that. So, Betty, this is the this is the digression you started us on. All right. Coming back to you, is there anybody else you're nominating as Jewish person Just of the year? In the in the in the collective vein that uh, Steve was talking about, there are a lot of Jewish students on campus that uh, in this atmosphere of cancel culture and antagonism towards Israel and, uh, uh, and anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. There are a lot of uh, Jewish kids on campus that are being very courageous and raising their voices in NYU or in San Francisco or in other universities at Columbia. Many of them, they're, uh, and, and they're writing op-eds and they're speaking out and I think they're, really wonderful and brave and um, deserve our admiration. Lovely. Jonathan Tobin, who is your person of the Jewish person of the year? Well, I go last so I get to evaluate other people's choices. So you, first, yeah, you're clean up. Steve Bain, your choice was what Time Magazine should have chosen for its person of the year. That would have been right, your right. Uh, you're here. Eric and Betty, when you mentioned uh, Rabbi Steinsalt and, you know, and Rabbi Lloyd Sachs, um, you know, I, I think that's very true. I, I have written a couple of times about the Genesis Prize, which is the so-called Israel Nobel, the, Isra you know, the Jewish Nobel Prize. And I've been very satirical about it. I, I think the Jews don't need their own Nobel Prize. We, do, we win enough of the other ones. And I don't think uh, that Jewish organizations need more encouragements to be celebrating celebrities or rich people. But, and so I said that when they nominated a few people, people could vote. One of them 
was Lord Sachs. I think he was up against Steven Spielberg and Barbara Streisand and some, you know, internet mil billionaire. And I thought, you know, just the mere comparison is, 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 is inappropriate. Um, so I'm, I'm with you on, on um, honoring Rabbi Sachs and your evaluation of Rabbi Steinsaltz is right on the mark. I think he will be remembered as long as uh, the printed word um, in terms of uh, Jewish thought. However, since I was asked to come up with one person and I'm gonna, you know, and as a journalist, I have to go for the more controversial pick. Um, I'm gonna choose what for me was the unlikely hero of the year or maybe of the last four years in terms of the Jewish people. And that was Jared Kushner. And I say unlikely because he was the last person one would think of, he, you know, he had no qualifications to be in charge of Middle East policy other than the fact that he was you know, related to the president very closely. Um, and there was a lot of mockery of the presidential son-in-law. And yet this year he delivered some historic agreements. Um, one shouldn't underestimate his personal role in that um, and his ability to get the president to sign on to it. He was not personally involved in these negotiations um, himself. Um, I think was an extraordinary achievement. I think, and, and because it was such an unlikely um, development, not something most of us who write about this for a living would have anticipated, I think he deserves some credit. He deserves to be remembered as like having done something just simply amazing. And even if he and his wife, Ivanka, are canceled, <laughs> if they want to go back to New York or want to go back anywhere because, you know, the, uh, the chattering classes uh, will hate anybody associated with Trump forever. I think this will, with this will be his, you know, um, in journalism, we always talk about what's, what's the headline on your obit? You know, you know, what are you most remembered for? And you always have to be careful about doing something that might be your most remembered thing that might be the headline on your obit and it might not be a good thing. Um, I think this deserve as much as well, I guess marrying Donald Trump's daughter might be the most famous thing. Jared Kushner does, but in terms of the significance of his life, I think this may be the headline on his obit and I'll give him Jewish person of the year for 2020 for that. I am so impressed with all of your answers and your picks. I will share with you mine and you can react if you'd like to, although why should you? Um, Steve, I love what you did when you said it would it really should be a, a group award this year. And for me, it's not simply the Jews who were on the front line of the medical world fighting COVID. And I'm sure you did not, I think you even said it was not about Jewish, but that all those were who fought and who risked their lives and did just God's work um, helping people, helping those who could survive, survive. And they've gotten better and better at it. Call like a vote to them. I was fortunate enough to speak to many doctors at Hadassah Hospital and somebody at Shari Tzedek. And I told them the same thing. Call like a vote to you. You're doing God's work. So although I, I didn't think of it that way, when you said it, it resonated with me and I was very, very pleased that, that you said it and, it and it also seems to reflect what many of you would be comfortable with. And then for me, uh, the fact that virtually all of you, I, I, Betty, you said it in a sort of a different way, but all of you said that if it wasn't the COVID virus, the most significant event of 2020 for the Jewish people and for the long-term effect, influence, impact on the Jewish people was the Abraham Accord, which to me was far and away the, mo the single most important Jewish event of 2020. I give the President of the United States the credit for that. And I mentioned in my open, Jared Kushner, David Friedman, the ambassador for, uh, for the United States to the state of Israel, uh, Jason Greenblatt, who was a chief negotiator, and um, Avi, oh, and I'm suddenly- Mike Berkowitz. 
Avi Berkowitz, who basically stepped in when uh, Jason stepped away, those people did the grunt work, but they did it because there was a president of the United States who gave them the green light to do it. And he said he was going to do it. He was ridiculed as much as he was ridiculed at anything else. And the fact that one gives him credit for one thing does not in any way say you are giving him credit for everything or that you're approving of everything he was or is. We are about to see him leave office. You know, when, when Betty and when uh, Jonathan talk about how cancerous the interchange is now within families and among friends, how you can't talk to one another. It's over. Joe Biden will be president in less than a month. Let's just leave it alone. Donald Trump was a phenomenon. He did many wonderful things for Israel. He did many wonderful things for America. And he did many things that troubled people to their core. But the Abraham Accords will live on. And I believe he is entitled no less than Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, or Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres and Yasser Arafat, he is no less entitled in my mind to a Nobel Peace Prize. And for me, although I know this will upset so many who hate him, loathe him, despise him, I don't see how he cannot be considered, certainly considered um, for Jewish person of the year. And for me, that is the Jewish person of the year. Well, two, two comments, Mark, for what they're worth. Number one, I don't believe uh, Arafat belongs in, in that category to begin with. In other words, sure, he signed the Oslo Accords. How much blood did he have on his hands? And how many times did he violate the Oslo Accords? But the second point is somewhat larger, and it depends what you mean by person of the year. Uh, is it someone who accomplished something very specific and you want to underscore that accomplishment? Or is it someone who uh, in general embodied the, uh, the values, the ideas, the aspirations and goals that uh, you would define as being you know, the person of the year? I don't see uh, Donald Trump as doing that. Um, he accomplished a good number of things. He also damaged the very fabric of America by polarized, by increasing the polarization. Uh, he kept, his line was that of uh, watch what we do, not what we say. His rhetoric meant a great deal because he polarized the country through the rhetoric. I have regard for you Mutual. at the highest level. We don't always agree. The issue here is that if I answer you, we will go another hour. So for the sake <laughs> of everybody here, I will end. And now I just want to say to all of you, I don't know where in the Jewish world you get to sit with four people like Stephen Bain, Betty Ehrenberg, Jonathan Tobin, and Eric Yaffe. I don't know where. And hear them talk about a range of issues. And I get chills even saying it. Um, this was a fabulous two-part review of a very, very painful, difficult year, 2020. And I hope each one of you knows how dear you are to me and how very, very much I appreciate your willingness to give me so much time to spend with the L'chaim and the JBS audience. I wish every one of you, kol tu as we enter a new calendar year. Mazal tov on all the work each of you have done in your area. You should only go from strength to strength. You and your family should be healthy and you should come out of this COVID and be able to join me in studio one day, once again. But in the meantime, I just want you to know how much it is meant to me to be able to share these two programs with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank Great you, to be with Mark. you, Mark. Thanks thank to you. You. Thank you. You're, you're, you, you bring out the best in us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. happy new year.
L'chaim, and okay. Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you very much. The thoughts of Stephen Bain, Betty Ehrenberg, Jonathan Tobin, and Eric Yaffe. As they assess some of the most important events of this past Jewish year, 2020, and offer for your consideration their Jewish person of the year. I hope you've enjoyed and learned from them all. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me at rabbigalab at jbstv.org or write me at Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. And please remember, you can now listen to the L'Chaim podcast. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends. Happy New Year to life. L'Chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.